So next up, we'll be talking about transforming journalism. And we have a great panel for you today. Um, moderating is Elizabeth Wojcicki. She's a business and technology reporter whose work has been published in Business Week, Forbes, and Money Magazines. She's also the author of the book, The Smartphone, Anatomy of an Industry, and one of the leaders of another Yale SIG, the Yale Alumni Journalism Association. We also have Kevin Delaney, who is the editor-in-chief and co-president of Quartz, which is a global business news site from Atlantic Media. It launched in 2012 and today reaches over 10 million unique visitors each month. Previously, Kevin was a reporter at the Wall Street Journal and then the managing editor of WSJ.com. And he championed efforts there to greatly expand the journal's online readership. He was named a business or the business journalist of 2013 by the Talking Biz News Media website. We also have Aaron Pettigrew, who is the chief strategy officer at Gawker Media. Since joining the company in 2005, she has led, um, grown, and run multiple teams that help to scale its news stories and advertising products from small local blogs to a collection of international properties that reach more than 125 million people. Today, she leads product development and strategic planning of the company's technology initiatives, and she was the recipient of the Digital Media Leadership Award. So I will now turn it over to Elizabeth. Thank you. Thanks, Alina. So we've been talking about the transforming effects of technology all day, and this is a topic that's especially relevant to journalism. As uh, Kevin pointed out to me, this week has been full of news about digital media transformations and new products. Um, on Monday, Politico launched a Europe po politics site, politico.eu. On the same day, the South China Morning Post, which is Hong Kong's largest English language newspaper, uh, launched an international edition, which is meant to be a portal about China news for international readers. And then on Tuesday, both the Atlantic and the Wall Street Journal unveiled major website uh, redesigns. So I think, you know, this week has probably been busier than most, but it's certainly representative of the constant evolution of the digital media landscape. So let's start by putting um, sort of a personal lens on today's topic of transforming journalism. Uh, if you could both talk about the changes you've observed in digital media since you started your own career, so within the context of your careers, and that can be editorial and or business changes. Sure. When I, um, I started at Gawker Media in 2005, and at the time, I think the big question was, can you do news on the internet at all? Is that something that's going to work? Is that something that's commercially viable? Is that something that will succeed and kind of erode at print journalism? Or is that just something that's going to live in a silo on the side? And so over the last 10 years that I've been at the company, we solved that problem. And the answer is that, yes, digital is going to sort of become a thing on its own, news will survive and be viable through the online space and no longer sort of print the kind of monolith that it was in the past. Um, it's been a lot of evolution and I think the technology that's been the undercurrent throughout has really seen a lot of change as well. Um, I think for me one of the funniest things is that when I joined the company, Gizmodo, our technology title, was covering gadgets like MP3 players and like even sort of, you know, like really old school computers and laptops and, and now it's obviously wearable devices and drones and things like that. You can just see the evolution of technology sort of through our content as well, which has been fascinating. So the, so the thread for me uh, in journalism has been kind of tinkering and experimenting. So I was class of 94 in Styles. I was editor-in-chief of the Herald, and uh, at that moment, uh, desktop publishing was coming in. So we were using the Macintosh you know, sort of revolutionized access to actually desktop publishing. And so, you know, starting in 90 when I arrived at Yale, we were using the first versions of Photoshop and PageMaker. We uploaded the Herald to, by FTP to um, Mosaic and these things that sort of preceded the web as we, as we use it today. And what was really exciting about that time was actually using the technology that was just kind of emerging at Yale uh, to, to accompany journalism and do things that were, that were creative and exciting and, and were previously unaccessible. So the, so the last, you know, sort of zoom forward 20 years, I, went, I left Yale, I worked in television, which was sort of like the new media of the 90s, uh, and then wound up at the, at the Wall Street Journal as a technology correspondent. So I was based in San Francisco. And at some point, the, the news was just, you know, 
incredibly depressing for the journalism industry to the point where you had to ask, like, am I going to have any career 20 years from now? And in fact, if you look at the, the chart of the number of journalists employed in the United States, it's incredibly bleak. So it goes, you know, from the high point in the 70s or 80s, whenever it in, it is. And, the, and it's a sort of endless decline from there. Um, and so in 2008, I came back to work on WSA.com with this sort of feeling that we needed to save journalism and that sort of superficial aggregation and SEO maximization was actually something that traditional news organizations need to be better about or at least be actively thinking about. But that ultimately there was something that went beyond that journalistically that was of value to all of us and actually did have a possible thriving future online. And so, um, so to fast forward three, a little bit more, three years ago I left the Wall Street Journal and joined the company that owns the Atlantic. And that was precisely our, uh, our venture, starting from zero to create a news organization, uh, one that is journalistic but also digital, um, and, and figure out if we could make this viable in terms of attracting a readership but also in terms of um, creating a business that's, that's ultimately profitable. So uh, let's tackle the big question for digital journalism, which I think is um, the question of sustainability, meaning financial viability. Given that the traditional journalism business model of you know, selling subscriptions to readers and a small number of high-priced ads to advertisers is no longer as effective or relevant online, um, it seems that for publishers today, there is sort of no one revenue strategy. It's about drawing upon a number of different revenue streams, trying a combination of things. So I was wondering if, if you two could talk about um, what you found, what, what works, what hasn't, um, in terms of uh, financial sustainability for journalism online, and also how you decided on the combination of revenue streams you're currently using. Yeah, so we, um, we started out being very ad-supported and kind of said, let's translate everything that we know about traditional media to the web. Okay, that's an ad-supported business. It's major sort of blue-chip clients that are buying through ad agencies. And we went out and did that, and we said, okay, we can put that online. And so when I first started at the company, it was literally figuring out how to get, like, JPEG banners from, you know, Stoli Vodka onto the site. And that, in itself at that time, was actually a difficult thing to do. Um, but it was promising because there were brands that were interested in spending. But at that time, it was very experimental. And so as, you know, the years have passed, we've seen that that translation of the traditional advertising business has come online entirely. I think the share is still, um, you know, it's still growing over time, but the growth rate has slowed because it's basically sort of reached a level of penetration online that it's pretty healthy. But now we're at a point where that ad business isn't supporting every single expense that many of these media companies have. And so revenue diversification has become like an enormous part of many sort of business and sales side organizations at media companies. Our business at Gawker is roughly 75% kind of traditional online advertising and then 25% sort of experimental revenue streams that run from e-commerce through affiliate marketing and kind of offers uh, for products to readers to international licensing partnerships to actually licensing the content that we produce to a variety of different commercial constituents. All of those explorations have been really important and interesting to us. It's basically come down to the web gives you a lot more um, options in terms of revenue model. So we look at the massive audience we've accrued and say, okay, we're the natural sort of fits between what is the audience looking for, information, interesting things about products, where are our commercial partners seeing like a natural fit with our audience, and where can we align those better through kind of new business models. A lot of what we're doing in that 25% kind of area, we expect to grow and kind of challenge the ad business that we have now for something closer to parity between sort of a mix of new and healthy streams and kind of the traditional business that supported a lot of, kind of big consumer media in the past. And by the way, Erin didn't mention this, but I believe she built up the affiliate marketing business at Gawker Media into a multi-million dollar business. Um, through yeah, sort it's of, been really good. It's pretty impressive. Yeah. So, um, so I think the good news is sort of three years in with Quartz, the good news is that actually media um, is a sustainable and profitable, or can be a profitable business. Um, the, the back of the envelope business plan for Quartz, very, very approximate, was that the uh, the annual advertising revenue for The Economist and The Financial Times together was $500 million a year. Um, and that most of that was print, but you could make a sort of bet that a lot of that was going to migrate online. And that if we could get just 5%, 5% of, of 
something that seems like a small amount. If we get 5% of an existing amount of money that people are spending to spend them on a digital, high-quality, global uh, media organization that's speaking to business professionals around the world, that seemed like a pretty doable thing. And we knew that we could do that on a cost basis with a cost structure because we're starting from scratch that actually would allow us to be profitable. We're only partway down that road, but the, the first part of this voyage, um, it confirms our initial instincts about the potential there. So our, our revenue is uh, primarily advertising. We do some events. The Atlantic has a super strong uh, events business, and we've benefited from, they have the Aspen Ideas Festival and other things that, they, they, um, that are a significant portion of revenue to support the enterprise and support their journalism. Um, and, and the work that Aaron has done at Gawker is really industry leading and looking for other revenue sources, which is some, something we're interested in doing. But there is really, there, the opportunity just on av advertising revenue alone is really uh, significant. Quartz has had over 100 advertisers at this point, all of them brands that you guys would know, banks and car makers and things like that. We have close to a 90% renewal rate. So there is a sort of vibrant market uh, for, for this, sort of, um, this sort of advertising. Part of the context for this question is that if you're a traditional news organization and you have a building and you have bureaus around the world and you have um, all of the printing infrastructure and all of these capital investments that these organizations are sustaining, this is a really difficult time. And the, 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 I give the New York Times and others a ton of credit for, for uh, being a, much more experimental than they've ever been, much more digitally thinking. But they're still part of a transitional moment where it, it, it's, it's less like a media and audience moment. It's more like an economic business case, economic model moment where they have to migrate from one that's very different than what ultimately most people, I think, believe uh, the media has come in. And that's why the New York Times is like doing great. But you know, they're every year at these big news organizations, they're, they're quiet or not so quiet, buyouts and layoffs and, and other sort of symptoms of the, the, the difficulty of making that economic adjustment. I think a lot of us, I was just going to piggyback on that. A lot of us spent a lot of time last year reading the New York Times Innovation Report. So everybody in media, as soon as this thing came out, it was like 80 pages um, that were put together to show how the New York Times could transition to an effective digital business on like a cost basis and a revenue basis and all these different things. And I think we all circulated that around. And it was a big moment where it, it made me really glad to be in kind of a pure play digital business and not have to go through that transition yeah. that you're describing because um, it's, it's hard. Now, there was a question earlier today about native advertising, and I thought we should take a minute and talk about that since these are two websites that are doing native advertising, and I think, you know, doing it very successfully. So I think one of the interesting questions there is sort of the effectiveness of native ads compared to a more traditional display ad in terms of um, both the outcomes advertisers are looking for, so whether it's brand lift or engagement or, or whatnot, and then also in terms of the higher rates that you're able to charge advertisers for them. Yeah, so we actually started experimenting with native advertising before it even had that moniker. Um, we called something a sponsored post back in, I think it was 2009 or 2010, and said, the currency that we communicate with our audience in is actually the blog post. What if we actually translated advertising from the banner into a blog post and started writing sponsored copy? And those of you who have spent time in media also know that this isn't really even an innovation. Magazines have been doing paid editorial. Radio has been doing paid spots for a long time. But we started this quite a while ago. And, and the idea was that we could have a much more quality kind of relationship with the, the consumer over sort of a written piece of content. And that proved to be the case. So over the last six, seven years, we've grown that business quite a bit to where we now have um, kind of two channels of it. There's a, an awareness-based effort, so big branded content programs for major advertisers that are all about getting brand lift for specific programs through um, awareness-based posts. And then we have kind of a direct response uh, version of that same program, which is uh, incentivized on a um, sort of a, a cost per action basis or performance-based um, pricing, and that actually sells products to the readership through content, again, marked as sponsored, but gives us an opportunity to kind of play with that full funnel. Both of those, we think, are more effective than the standard banner advertising. Um, but it's not the case that they're entirely displacing. We often see that these things get bundled into a kind of bouquet of offerings for the same advertiser that's looking to communicate a variety of different messages at a variety of different moments through a variety of different products to our rather large audience. 
So I don't, think, I don't think digital media, as Aaron said, gets credit for inventing native content. When you open the New York Times some, day, some days and it says, special advertising section, and the headline of the article is, people in Russia are happier than anywhere else in the world. <laughs> um, you, as a reader of the New York Times, understand that that is not something that the New York Times Moscow bureau chief has written, presumably. So it's a similar thing. The important thing, there are two important principles for, that we believe. One is that you never try and fool the reader. So there's extensive labeling at every point where a reader could actually interact with this content. The second thing is that the editorial staff should have zero involvement with this. And so as editor in chief, I actually see none of the uh, sponsor content until it's on the site and other readers presumably ha uh, have seen it already. Um, it is a growing area. It's an area of intense advertiser interest. I don't know the, the sort of data on the, the amount of engagement. I do, I can recount one short anecdote, which is that I was, um, I was uh, in Davos this winter and I was, I was the only person there for courts and I was frantically trying to cover it and get over jet lag. And, and I woke up in a haze one morning and was looking at our traffic and there's this, po there was this headline in our chart beat system which kind of monitors the real time traffic and it was Davos highlights from day two. And so I looked at this and I was thinking like, did I write that and just not remember it? Um, and it turns out that we had a bank that was sponsoring um, uh, sponsor content. And what they were doing is actually paying someone to write highlights of, uh, of Davos. And it turns out that that post was actually more popular on our site that, than, you know, unfortunately anything that I had written in the previous 40, 48 hours. So I, it's, I'm at a distance from it, but I can tell you that I, I observe that people do read this stuff, uh, yeah. particularly when it, when it has some informational value. I think to echo that, um, most of the organizations that are succeeding with this have entirely insulated kind of that sponsored content, native advertising production from the editorial teams and all for the best. Um, it's been yeah. pretty clean, I think, and, and that's what's allowed it to see success. So by the way, if any of you are wondering whether these business strategies are successful, um, Gawker Media is profitable and Quartz is still in investment mode because it's only two and a half years old. Keep that in mind. Um, so one uh, revenue stream we didn't talk about, but which I think will become really relevant in the near future, is this idea of Facebook allowing publishers, allowing Facebook to host um, their content directly on Facebook's site. Uh, again, this question came up briefly this morning with the Henry Blodgett presentation. Uh, and Henry basically said, as a, as a digital publisher, he was OK with the idea. But I wanted to run this hot topic past the both of you and um, See, uh, I do think certainly, so again, this is um, a story that the New York Times broke about a month ago. It's about having, um, instead of clicking through to a story on Facebook, you're going to be able to read the entire article on Facebook. You will sort of stay within the Facebook ecosystem. And um, I think it's pretty clear that that I'll just stand here for a while. So I think it's pretty clear that that makes sense for Facebook and for Facebook users, but um, to get the perspective of from a, a digital publisher, does that make business sense for you to partner with Facebook on that? So I think uh, you know a, a digital publisher or any publisher for that matter holds like two things in really high regard in terms of relationships. One is the publisher's relationship with its audience, its readership, and the other is the publisher's relationship with its commercial partners or its advertisers. Um, I think it's unclear for me right now kind of where Facebook's rumored publisher partnership program is going to, how it will, I guess, affect those relationships that publishers hold really near and dear. Um, we've seen a lot from the way that Facebook has become such an immense traffic channel for publishers that they, they are kind of coming in and taking a little bit of that reader relationship away from the publisher or, or kind of becoming an intermediary for it. Um, Facebook has not really announced what it might offer as far as the uh, advertising share that might be available and things like that. So I'm really anxious to see kind of how the product actually rolls out, how it um, looks to preserve those relationships for readers and for advertisers for the publisher because those are going to be sort of the major points of concern for any publisher that's reached a, a level of size that it really has those relationships that it, it's concerned about protecting. So it'll be interesting to watch. 
I think, you know, I think ultimately what our goal is is to have our content wherever readers are. And if our readers are on Facebook and this is somehow a better experience for them, that's something that we probably should be open to. Already, Quartz content is available on Flipboard and Google Newsstand, which used to be called Currents. And there are a bunch of places where you can actually get our content. We're fine with that, particularly if, as Aaron said, the conditions are good for us being able to make some revenue from it, to actually pay for our journalists, to make our... To, to grow our business. And so that's a, that's a question mark about Facebook. But in general, I think publishers are really required to feel comfortable about having their content live off, off their site. Um, there's, you know, there are some legitimate questions that this raises about the, the, the extent to which publishers are doing this exclusively, the extent to which they lose control over, over reaching a readership. And you know, there's, this is for legal and First Amendment scholars to debate. But there are questions about. Um, the pressures that governments uh, could bring to bear on Facebook in terms of distributing content uh, in their countries, or Facebook has enforced uh, certain standards around nudity and other societal norms that it could effectively apply to journalistic content, which may or may not um, be consistent with how, how newspapers or news organizations think think today. So I think, that's a, I think that's an interesting question. The last thing I would say is that a lot of the discussion around Facebook assumes that Facebook is the only platform that exists on the planet. And, 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 and I don't think that's true. I mean, they're, they're clearly the one that is most important for media organizations right now. But particularly as you think about mobile phones and the apps and the operating systems, and you can very quickly come up with, a, a, with a, at least a few other platforms um, that could apply competitive pressure to Facebook in how they treat uh, content that ultimately could, could be good for publishers as a result. So today, um, a couple of the different panels and discussions have touched upon the uh, business importance of tracking data uh, and mining data. And um, in journalism, I think the focus used to be on page views, and then it for the most part went to unique visitors. And now there's some um, attention being paid towards various measures of reader engagement, however uh, you measure it. So for instance, I think BuzzFeed looks at social shares, so how much is being shared to social networks. Um, and given this is a very tech-centric crowd, um, I think they'd be interested in hearing both of you talk about the metrics you pay attention to at your websites and um, how you define success in relation to those metrics. Yeah, so for us, uh, data is different across different parts of the organization. So, you know, on the business side, people are very concerned about engagement, as you describe. Um, the ad, online ad universe has really turned toward viewability as an understanding of kind of a defrauding of online advertising. Are people actually seeing ads? How much time are they spending with them? Are they kind of, if it's a video playing through the entirety of the video or some portion of it, it's enough to be considered a true view? That would be sort of like the focus on the ad side of the business. On the technology side of the business, there's a lot of focus on any kind of, any kind of metric we can learn more about, but time spent and engagement is definitely um, a heightened sense of, of importance right now. But on the editorial side of the business, we've gone through a few arcs. Um, we went from page views, just as you described, where you know a post getting 100,000, 500,000, a million page views was seen as a record moment, and that was a very exciting for everybody and signaled success uh, for the writers. Uh, then came unique visitors, which was a way to sort of like bring page views into an understanding of people. And, and that was uh, something that led to, I think, a bit of sensationalism, a bit of uh, pandering toward just attracting a new eyeball uh, at every single moment. So our, our editorial staff has moved to something new and kind of skipped past engagement for right now, away from sort of quantity metrics and toward a quality metric. So they've instituted something that they call a story bonus um, and done away with incentivization on um, uh, sort of a quantity-based metric, like a unique or a page view. So now each site uh, submit stories that they think are really representative of our organization's kind of journalistic ideals. And those are vetted at the end of each month, and then there's sort of a, a discussion about which stories best represent the type of journalism that we want to be creating. And that, for us, was a reaction to what we saw happening at so many of our competitors who were turning toward a, a more lower kind of common denominator type of content in order to get traffic from Facebook and to get traffic from these places that were really doing a lot of clickbait games. So story bonus for us has been a way to kind of return to quality. We don't know what that's going to do to you know, reach numbers in the long term, so it's a risk that we're taking. But we think it's important to kind of say, hold on, wait a minute. Content was sort of moving down in quality. We need to return to a high 
kind of standard for that content quality and kind of see what that does for the business and hope that if we're true to the reader with a really good story, that all else will kind of prevail in the end. We'll see what happens. And I think Gawker is also um, investing more in investigative reporting again, right? Yes. Your scoops and... Yes, we've spent a lot of time kind of going back to basics on what, what does it mean to sell, tell a story to a reader. Um, and so we've created kind of a, a, an editorial services group that's actually you know, staffed with investigative reporting that is focused on quality and providing support to writers with more kind of graphic and video and, and illustration, all these types of things, to really focus on telling better stories every day. Kevin? So, I, so our use of data, I think, is pretty similar in that it's just totally pervasive in the organization from the advertising sales to technologists to the journalists. And so they're, um, they're, our approach is very similar. One thing I would just um, piggybacking on what Aaron said, one thing that's really interesting is that when you look at the data about what people read, um, we, we, we talk about it conceptually as a curve. And the idea, it's a sort of U-shaped curve. And it turns out what people read is sort of on the ends of the curve. And on the sort of y-axis is success. And then on the x-axis is, um, is ambition, length, um, that sort of thing. And so uh, to be more specific, people read things that are short, focused, shareable, visual, in the flow of the news. In, uh, we think about things that are under 500 words. They often contain charts. We produce lots of charts on quartz. Those are, those are really uh, widely read. It makes sense, in particular, given the amount of time people spend reading news on their phones, that something that's very easily digested and shared and is sort of clear what it's about and why you should be reading is something that would be popular. But actually, it turns out that on the other end of the curve, um, there is an enormous readership for, uh, for in-depth, ambitious, long-form journalism where there's a payoff for the reader in terms of narrative, analysis, reporting. Um, and it turns out that those articles, um, which you know, often are thousands of words long, are actually just as popular as the short, sort of socially enabled, focused um, things that are written on the news. A, a really good example of this is um, the cover stories of The Atlantic. So The Atlantic has these cover stories that are often about 10,000 words long. Um, the you know, recent one was about ISIS, 10,000 word, pretty wonky story. Um, the Case for Reparations by ta Coates, 10,000 words. These stories are among the most popular uh, stories among, uh, across the company. And it turns out that when you look at the data, readers, the, the number of visits actually exceed the number of um, visitors, which tells you that people actually are starting to read the story. It's 10,000 words long, so this is like half an hour commitment or something to read it. But they're actually coming back and finishing the story, or at least reading more of it. And by the way, if you're wondering how long a 400, 500 word story is, as a reporter, I'm typically writing 800 to 1200 word stories. So we're talking about stories that are about half the length at Quartz compared to um, a sort of traditional business media article. All right. They're more efficient to read. <laughs> we're looking after our readers' time. Efficiency. Um, so one aspect of the, of the digital journalism business I think sometimes gets overlooked is um, technology and design. So I was hoping to talk about um, sort of the importance of um, these content management systems or publishing platforms and whether um, you think that um, uh, digital publishers, digital media companies need to be technology companies as well, sort of how important it is to have technology embedded into all the aspects of your business and how you um, have managed to do that at your companies? Yeah, when I came to Gawker in 2005, that was the age of, there were a couple of different sort of consumer level um, publishing platforms available. There was like Blogger, WordPress, Movable Type. We actually started the business on Movable Type. Um, and we just started using this off the shelf CMS to produce our business. It quickly became apparent that we needed a level of customization, sort of multiple site management, multiple author management, et cetera, that just wasn't available from the off the shelf product. So we, as many sort of news organizations did, started to build a homegrown CMS at the time. And that ended up being a decision that we felt was part of. I would say like a competitive advantage for us. It allowed us to get news out very quickly, 
to iterate on kind of the way that we format and deliver news to the reader to we started very early with building a comment system that was integrated into our actual CMS, whereas many of the comment systems now are separate sort of um, embeds that you kind of wrap into a, a CMS. We've kind of been working for a long time on building a system that is um, specifically aimed at meeting our own needs on both the writer side and the reader side. And we view that as really important to our specific business. I think we're at a level of scale where, where we do need that, and that is important. Um, for us, that also gives us some sense of the future of like what owning the distribution to our readership is going to look like. Um, as we talk about things like Facebook, uh, potentially creating a publishing platform or publishing environment, you start to realize how having made an investment in technology for your own publishing starts to be very critical to understanding where that relationship with the reader and the publisher is going to end up. So for us, we intend to be very, very bullish on building our own platform, continuing kind of this arc of technology in-house that we've had for a long time. And I think it's almost still nascent in our organization. I think we anticipate that getting a lot bigger and potentially being of benefit to other publishers in the future. Lots of future plans kind of on our roadmap for that. Right, so the potential possibly in the future to, um, for other news organizations to license Kinja, the platform that... Or for a consumer to maybe, you know, spend a bit of time creating the news on our platform oh. and, and benefit from a shared ecosystem of a lot of readers who are already there looking for news. And then at Quartz, um, I mean, I think have, if you've looked at Quartz, you'll notice the, um, it's sort of now there are all these copycats trying to do the infinite scrolling effect. Um, and so there's this amazing hybrid of a web app uh, acting like an app, but actually technically a website. So if you could. Well, so, so technology has been really important. We're still a relatively small organization, we have, but we have probably close to 15 developers and four designers working on the product and advertising, which relative to our size is way off the scale for a media organization. And one, and we, you know, it's exactly what you'd expect. Like we view technology and design as, you know, arguably more important than the day-to-day -day journalism to our to our ultimate success. Um, and I should probably take that back because we have a bunch of journalists who think what they're doing is most important. So please, please don't tweet that out yet. I need to have a staff conference to calm everybody. Um, everyone is equally important at Quartz: the developers, the advertising sales, the journalists. The designers, um, and uh, but it's like it's critical. And the one, th the few things that we've done structurally that are really important is the journalists and the developers sit next to each other in the newsroom. The designers they sit back to back. We had them all sort of scattered. The developers and the journalists scattered around. It turns out that there are advantages to having the developers a little more concentrated, but they're all in the same space. My previous experience was that the developers that I worked most closely with, many of them were located in another state. Um, and so that actually, they're in New Jersey. Um, and uh, that's just not ideal for like creativity and brainstorming, like figuring out what the future of the business, which is the absolute need of, uh, of media organizations now. There's one other incredibly powerful thing that happens when you do this, which is that you start creating tools that change the form and, and accelerate the journalism that you're able to do. So we very early on created this thing which we called Chart Builder. And what it is is it's a really simple uh, web-based tool that our journalists use to create charts. We put this in their hands. We built this ourselves. It's much less complicated or sophisticated than anything that Microsoft offers you or probably even Google Docs. But it enables you to make a really pretty chart in about two minutes. Um, and all, all of our journalists do that. So last year, our staff of journalists was probably in the range of like 20 reporters on average through the, through the year. They themselves produce 30, over 3,800 charts using this tool called Chart Builder. In a traditional, just to sort of signal how significant this is, in a traditional news organization, I, as a reporter who wrote hundreds and hundreds of articles for the Wall Street Journal, would have to go and email or walk over and request a chart. And you know, it was a, a much more kind of industrial manufacturing process than my just sort of making this myself. So we actually, um, we open source Chart Builder. It's available on GitHub and is used by a lot of these news organizations that have their own uh, graphic service department. But if we didn't have developers and journalists sitting together kind of figuring this out, that would, that, that would not have happened. Um, and so we touched, Kevin touched a little bit about the experience of reading on mobile um, when he was talking about you know, why Quartz articles are a little shorter than you might see in other business publications. But let's do sort of a deeper dive into 
mobile, um, I think people will probably be interested in uh, what you've observed in terms of how people read on mobile devices and how you have um, you know, tweaked your, your websites to uh, look really good on mobile, to be a great reading experience on mobile, whether that's you know, redesigns or um, sort of journalistic training. Yeah, I think mobile, everyone, everyone knows it's, it's much smaller, so the reader value is a simpler, more direct experience, and so we've kind of taken that as our mantra, and we just have a very simple, you know, reverse chronological listing of every post with enough of an excerpt and sort of an image thumbnail to give a clue to what the post might be about, to allow you to have that kind of snackable reading experience, but to allow you to tap in and actually, you know, read the entire post. And I think that's pretty standard, uh, but simplicity has been kind of the guiding goal. There are things you start to discover about mobile that, that guide other design directions. Uh, so for instance, we just did kind of an experiment on what does it mean to the reader to uh, launch a new window when opening uh, a link? And so on desktop, we found there was virtually no difference in sort of the user's preference. They were kind of OK with uh, a forced new window, or they you know, would be fine opening in the same window. But on mobile, that was an extremely uh, unpleasurable experience. People did not want new windows to be like force popped on mobile. And so that's a piece of data you take back and kind of incorporate into what you're building. I think we want to have the most sort of pleasant, easy, accessible experience. We're entirely mobile web right now. Um, so we've basically taken a very responsive um, design approach. What you get on the desktop is very similar to what you get on mobile, just a very simple stream. We want to make it very easy, accessible, free, open to anyone. Yeah, roughly half of our readers come in on mobile and tablet devices, which is pretty much the industry norm. And I think the most valuable thing you can do on mobile is to have your site load really fast and to get rid of anything that is not of uh, utility on the screen to the vast majority of your readers. And so what we've done is worked a ton on the performance of just getting it to load fast, load fast, and actually ex and removing buttons and uh, and frames, and when you're reading a court story, basically all you see is the text of the story. There's no other framing or our, we don't force our own share buttons because we know that Apple has really nice share buttons that most people use anyway. So, so um, that's sort of the primary thing that we've done, simplify and, and get it to the readers as fast as possible. So as of, I guess, pretty much right now, there's um, a new mobile screen that digital publishers can um, target and uh, designed for, and that's the uh, you know the very small the the smartwatch, the Apple Watch screen. So I was wondering, this is this is more future forward, but um, to what extent are you looking at um, how you want your reading experience to be on um, you know this 1.5 inch smartwatch screen, the tiniest screen in the world? Um, I think you know Apple's marketing their Apple Watch is the most personal device. And I think that's how you have to think about it for news as well. How can you, as a news publisher, deliver a very, very personal experience that's enough to interrupt or sort of give access to uh, on something that's living on your wrist? I don't think we know the answer to that yet. I think we produce thousands of articles per day. We would need to work on figuring out you know, what a user specifically wants to see, how we might kind of update them that that content is available, things like that. I think we'd be looking toward how can we create a very personal news experience from what is now a pretty sort of like you know, choose your own menu of, of thousands of different things to read. So we would need to do quite a bit of curation for that reader, I would think. Mm -hmm. But we're kind of not there yet. Um, the watch has yet to ship. Yeah, I agree. I think the barrier is really high. One of the, we have all these news publishers that are, they have watch apps that they're launching. Um, and the reality is that uh, users of the watch are going to turn off the notifications on their watch for virtually every <laughs> single one of these. And my understanding from talking to a developer about this is it's a binary thing. So you can't say, I'd like one notification a day from this annoying news watch app that is pinging my wrist every 10 minutes. You actually have to turn it, it's either on or off. And so you're turning over control for what's effectively uh, a simulated physical tap on your body to a news organization um, to, to interrupt whatever you're doing via this experience. So um, I, don't, I agree with Aaron. I don't, I'm not sure how this is going to end up. I'm not actually that one attitude in the face of this could be despairing. Like, you know, the window for, for news organizations to reach their readership has just shrunk to the size of a watch and one notification a day that a user might conceivably tolerate. 
I actually don't, I, that doesn't seem to me like the likely scenario. People do actually, you know, people are reading more news than ever. And that's not going to suddenly turn off because they have uh, a $500 or more Apple device uh, strapped to their with, wrist. I think what it means is that phones are going to continue being large and people are going to read news on them. And that's the platform that is ultimately the platform that publishers need to focus on above anything else. Right, so I think, I think the New York Times, CNN, and the Wall Street Journal, at least those, NPR also, um, have Apple Watch yeah. apps at launch. So it'll be interesting to see how, how popular those apps actually are. And also um, whether people click through to the story to read on their iPhone or actually read the whole article on their watch. I guess that's, that's yet to be seen. Um, so one thing we haven't talked about yet, but which I would like to, is video. Because we are seeing um, that's sort of a trend uh, amongst digital publishers to invest more in video. So I think uh, BuzzFeed, Vice, Vox Media have all either started entertainment divisions, some are based out in LA, or um, they sort of beefed up their, their video investments in general. Some of them are also looking towards longer form video content. Um, but both Gawker Media and Quartz are, are also investing more in video, and I think both of you sort of had recent video milestones. So if you could sort of talk about the value of video for, for sites like yours. Yeah, I think it's clear that readers or consumers, if you will, are really looking toward video as something that they want to spend time with. Um, I find it's a very captive experience, so you have to have something that's worth spending time with um, and that, that's worth putting everything that you're doing down and kind of you know, really take the reader's attention and give them sort of that two minutes or 30 seconds or whatever it is. Um, we've been watching the investment across the industry in video and wanted to make sure that what we did would be sort of efficient and profitable and all of those things. And so instead of investing and, in, you know, hiring a bunch of big TV execs to go and produce, you know, shows at the level uh, of production as you might see at a cable channel, we're taking, you know, a couple of steps down and saying, what is our version of producing video? It's similar to our version of producing the news, so it'll be, you know, really fun things to watch that help you kind of explore a topic or, or get closer to a news event uh, in a way that's visual and, and, and really sort of worth spending your time with. So we're starting to invest in that. We've had a lot of interest in video just organically on the platform. So in our uh, publishing platform, you can very easily embed video you know, from any different source. Something like a third to half of our articles actually contain an embedded video from another source. So we know there's a lot of appetite already. And now that there's also um, a chance at doing this at a lower cost, and as well, there's been ongoing demand from the advertiser side for video inventory. You know, All the pieces are kind of in play for us finally to say, OK, let's go out, um, build up a video team, and kind of see what we can produce for the readership that's really, really engaging, really, really exciting, and really, really on brand for us, which, to be fair, took a bit of time to understand and figure out. And I, th I think we have a really similar approach. The, just the macro context, the opportunity is really big. You know, and a lot of you are probably working uh, in the, in the area, areas of media and technology that are hoping to take advantage of the over-the-top opportunities that the sort of the, the cracks in the, in the decades-old model of uh, video entertainment in, in network television, cable television, cable uh, distribution, that's all like changing, really has changed dramatically over the last few years and will continue to change. News organizations like ours, actually, that, that's an opportunity for, uh, for us as well. The second part of the opportunity is that uh, the platforms that readers are using and Facebook in particular, Snapchat also, are, um, are creating real opportunities to distribute content via, if it is video. And so there are rewards for actually getting video right in the short term on those platforms. And in the longer term, the potential of the sort of remaking of video news and entertainment is something that I think we presume to have some opportunity to participate in at, at some point. So, um, Quartz is now about two and a half years old. Uh, we decided up until two weeks ago, effectively, not to do any video. And there are three reasons. First, we wanted to figure out who we were as a brand, as an editorial enterprise. The second thing is that there's so much mediocre video. It's, you know, things that look like the three of us here, you know, kind of on the, on the web. And, and, um, and it's like, it's hard to be proud of that or feel that that's amazing journalism, whatever the quality of the conversation is. Um, and then the, the and then it's also actually really easy to lose money on video because of the resources required to actually produce video. So it just didn't feel like something we wanted to get into. So we now we've hired three sort of uh, video polymaths. So they are people who can edit, produce. They're journalists, and they're uh, technically they have some animation skills, 
And we've created this um, kind of laboratory of playing with uh, video and, and publishing it directly to Facebook and YouTube to try and feel like what, are the, what do we have conviction around as things that, that are really interesting journalistically, editorially, and also that people are willing to watch. So we've now published five videos. Um, and we're going to kind of see how it, uh, five videos in a week and a half. And, uh, and we're going to build from there and, and try and get conviction around things that we then invest in further. That's sort of like the new triple threat for journalists, I guess, is to be good at video as well. Yeah. Um, so we, we've spent the past half hour talking about how this is a transformative time in journalism. And um, let's, let's peer into the future now a little bit. What do you think um, will sort of characterize the next phase of journalism? And what sort of uh, tools do you think a next generation digital publisher would need to have to be successful? Yeah, so the thing I spend a ton of time thinking about is just distribution and that publisher-reader relationship. I think that, kind of as I mentioned earlier, there's been such an impact to the content, quality of content because of kind of distribution coming from channels like Facebook and Snapchat and, and all of these that kind of prescribe a particular content quality or kind of um, a reframing of existing content to fit kind of a more mass um, appeal. Um, I think there's going to be a little bit of a, a correction against that. I don't know how that will manifest, but I think that's sort of something that I'm looking at on the horizon. It may take a little bit longer than, say, you know, like this year, but I, I think that's coming because I think people care about quality. I think they care about real, real conversation and real stories. Um, the other piece is just figuring out who will own distribution for media. Um, every other industry has gone through some kind of period of fragmentation and consolidation around specific distribution channels, and media is going through that right now. So I'm interested to see who the winners are. I think there's some early uh, strong sort of uh, contenders, but I think media is going to go through a very similar evolution where instead of maybe perhaps every single media organization delivering their content directly to the reader, there's going to be some sort of channel, some sort of intermediary, a variety of different access points. And I think that's happening and, and can't really be changed. But kind of have to make a decision at whether you as a media organization want to be sort of a supplier of content to a variety of different distribution channels or whether you want to sort of somehow build and manage and run your own in addition to supplying others. Mm, makes sense. Yeah, and I think, um, I'd agree. I think there are two parts of it. On the journalistic side, I think, um, well, actually on the sort of technical platform side, I think absolutely the publishers uh, who will succeed are the ones who minimize the friction for their content reaching its viewership or its readership. And this means that you make it really easy for your content to be, for people to watch it on their internet connected televisions or to access it and share it via Snapchat or WhatsApp or whatever. Like just there are technical ways, including having a really good, on a very basic level, having a really good API technically that allows your content to spread is, is sort of the most uh, important thing. And I think journalistically, it, there ne it needs to be, at the core, it needs to be quality content. And uh, quality content, but, but a little bit more creative and agnostic about the form, as we are not sitting down at our breakfast tables holding newspapers for 45 minutes. The actual way in which we want to consume information has changed. We're more likely on our phone, on the run. That might mean short articles. I, I suspect, my strong suspicion is that the standard unit of production of newspapers, which is and newswires, which is a, an article in the range of 800 words, um, I, I suspect that that will that will fall away because readers are not looking for those. Those are too inefficient to consume. They're too long. The actual nuggets of information are too buried in an unfocused uh, article. But there's not enough payoff for you in, in, because you're willing to sit with your phone or your computer and actually read something long if you actually learn something and enjoy the experience of, of reading it. So I think there's really excellent, excellent journalism going on digitally now. And, and we're going to see that morph uh, in ways that better match our reading habits in a way that's actually not less journalistic, but in some ways has the potential to be even more journalistic. Great. Um I think we have a minute or two for questions. Any questions? Victor? So I, actually, I have to ask this question because I was on course like, literally just now. And the headline reads, uh -oh. kids can, can't tell the difference between journalism and, and advertising. Yeah. Four out of five cannot tell the difference between journalism and advertising. And there's a nice chart. Thank you. <laughs> so this what, is, what is your response to 
this is a study from uh, Finland. So the Finns, Finnish children are clearly not uh, totally media le uh, literate, and they need more education uh, in that area. Um, the, my response to that is that Quartz is an independent news organization, and we have a reporter in London who found this really interesting study about uh, whether people can tell the difference between advertising and editorial content, and wrote it up. Our business model depends on, you know, our, our, our business model depends on people being able to tell the difference between editorial content um, and advertising. Um, and you know, I guess there's a debate over whether that's, uh, whether that's uniformly true. But I think it's also a sign that you know, we're not, uh, we have an independent journalism that actually is, um, is exploring areas that might actually be uncomfortable for us, or the, the, the people uh, on our teams who are out selling advertising. And in fact, actually, those teams are probably ecstatic, because the advertisers are probably really happy to know that uh, consumers <laughs> think that their, uh, their advertisements are, are similar to articles. By the way, Victor's question really touches upon um, another big online journalism trend, which is there's an incredible, um, incredibly refined art and science to writing headlines nowadays, and both Gawker Media and Quartz do, um, do the headline writing very well. But anyway, let's take more questions. Kevin? So, um, so the thing that we fought, we get that question a lot because people don't really totally know how to work with us on the PR side. That's the magic answer. <laughs> so the magic answer is we're really interested in data. And so as I said, we, our journalists created 3,800 charts uh, last year. And some of them were data sets that were supplied by companies that were ultimately uh, serving those companies' interests but we're actually, the data was a, a way to, to um, shed a light on interesting consumer behavior or, or business behavior. So um, a few examples of that, two, two quick examples of that. One is that um, there's, there's some flight sort of travel companies that have given us access to their flight pricing data. And so we have a, uh, a kind of data scientist who has crunched a lot of this data and written a bunch of stories about, um, about trends in, in ticket pricing. Um, that, you know, we of course acknowledge the company that supplied us with the data, we make really nice charts. That's a way to actually get attention. A second example is um, we did a piece where a company called ZocDoc supplied us with data about the, uh, about uh, doctor's appointment bookings by time of day and day of week. And so we just took this data and looked and wrote an article that said, if you want to, uh, if you want to go to an uncrowded doctor's office for your appointment or want to have, you know, not have to sit around, you should book your doctor's appointment at something like 11 a.m. on a Friday or something like that. And the data, the data were pretty clear about that. Someone told me that most doctors don't work on Fridays, don't see patients on Fridays, so that may be part of it. Um, but the answer to this is that we don't actually write about product announcements. We really can't stand press releases. There are other news organizations that will do that. Our service to our reader is to find out what's at the intersection of what's important, but also what's interesting. And the highest hit rate, the greatest success rate in pitches to us is when someone comes to us with a data set and says, I have data that, that, that um, provide this insight into how consumers behave or how a market operates or how people live around the world. And we're, you know, I'm not sure we've ever refuse any pitch that, that comes in along those lines. Um, right, there are all these new digital storytelling formats and I think it would probably behoove any company looking for publicity to think a little bit outside the box in terms of, you know, if you can offer something that's data driven or explanatory or something, you know, a little different from sort of a uh, press release type article. Yes, sorry. That's a cosmic question. question. <laughs> I think it's a strength. I mean, I think it's 
awesome that you know Facebook is a valley company that survives on creating a, a way to share and introduce people you know and love in your community to things that they should know and love as well. And the fact that media, which is housed in New York, is a thing that people should know and love is awesome. Uh, I think it's great that Facebook is finding ways to integrate with communities that aren't traditional sort of valley, um, you know, kind of denizens. I think that's awesome. Um, this is totally a, a generalization, and I'll get in trouble for saying it, but I think a lot about, again, totally a generalization, but the Valley is a lot about technology for technology's sake, and I think New York is so much about technology for the sake of industries that need to evolve and grow and adapt. So you have things like fashion, media, finance that are absolutely the center of the universe. Uh, New York is that place for them, and technology is coming here and be, being applied to those industries and really moving them forward, and I think Facebook recognizing that about media is awesome. Uh, I think it's totally a benefit. I think it's like good for the media industry. There's a concentration of talent here that's, that's combining media and technology that's, that's really pretty unparalleled, and it's great for companies like ours because we can easily interact with and find people. But I think your, you know, your point your question is a bit more cosmic, and I think it's interesting to think about what Silicon Valley is doing in another area, and that's the area of finance. So you asked Jamie Dimon who the biggest competitor to Wall Street is, and he has repeatedly said it is Silicon Valley. If you talk to the entrepreneurs out there in the Bay Area, um, they are creating alternative stock markets. They are uh, very aggressively thinking about alternative currencies, regulation, Basically, they're, they're, they're taking the, the financial infrastructure that is much more East Coast uh, than West Coast, and they're devising West Coast alternatives to the system that they view as broken and stuck and just kind of a hassle, basically. Um, and so that's their, um, that's their sort of view of the East Coast on some level, and it probably would be really smart if um, you know, their equivalents in, on the East Coast, sort of, it'd probably be healthy to, to do a sort of equivalent, um, to, to, to kick up an equivalent sort of competition in areas that the West Coast is strong in, but maybe is, uh, is, needs some competition. All right, well, I think we're out of time, so thanks for your smart questions, and thanks to Aaron and Kevin. Yeah, great, thank you.